right, hi everyone. I hope you guys are doing well, taking care. I hope you're following all of the uh, advice and recommendations about you know, distancing and washing your hands and all of that. And I hope that you're um, not super stressed out about um, the changes happening in classes. I hope to help in any way that I can uh, with that. So as far as human growth and development goes, we don't have any major changes because this was already an online class. But there were two things that I've had to tweak. One is proctoring. So I had planned to have you guys take exam four with a proctor. However, the testing centers are not likely to be available. So what we're gonna be doing instead will be using an authentication video. Uh, I have not yet worked out exactly the details on that, so I'll send out an email with that information as soon as I uh, work out all those details. But at the moment, you don't need to worry about having an appointment with the proctor because we're going to be doing authentication videos instead, which means that I will set exam four to not have a password. It'll be just like exams one through three. The other thing is that I'm having to change the timing of things a little bit because of the extended spring break. So you're not required to do anything during the extended spring break. Um, classes officially start back on March 23rd, but I'm posting this video a little bit early in case students want to work ahead. So if you want to, that's fine. Um, what I have done is I have updated the due dates on the activities. I have also set the activities to be available starting now because my plan is to let you guys have as much flexibility as possible to work ahead if you would like to. So I'm going to have the activities they are already set to be open now. As long as you submit them by the times and the dates that they're due, that's fine. I am also planning on getting the videos up as soon as possible for the rest of the semester so that you can watch those whenever you have a chance to do that. One thing I will say about those videos is that I had already recorded the videos for the rest of the semester. So I'm going to be using those videos that I already recorded. I'm just going to change the introduction bit where I'm giving announcements and that kind of thing. So if there's ever anything that I say in the video that's confusing to you, please feel free to email me. Um, refer to the announcements at the beginning portion of the videos, which will be updated. Refer to this updated schedule that I am going to be posting for you on Canvas. Essentially, what I've had to do is move exam three back a week, uh, so I'll get that updated in Canvas, and then compress this last section. So I was going to have this information spread out over four weeks. Now, because of the shorter semester, we're going to have to do it over three weeks, and that's part of the reason why I'm going to try to get these videos up as soon as possible so that you can watch them whenever you're available so that you have the most flexibility. All right. So as far as the dates for exam four and the final exam, they haven't changed at all. The only thing that's different is that you will not need to take exam four with a proctor, but I will send out information about those authentication videos as soon as I have that. All right. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me. Otherwise, we're going to get into our regularly scheduled programming of our lecture video. You guys have a great day. All right, so as I said, today we're going to be talking about social relationships in young adulthood. So as I said, this is likely the stage of life that you guys find yourselves in. So this information may be very uh, relevant to you at the moment. We're going to be talking primarily about different types of relationships today and the importance of those relationships. Starting off with friendships. During this time, as we've already talked about, intimacy is very important, intimate relationships are important, but an intimate relationship would not necessarily have to be a romantic relationship. Intimacy just refers to a psychological closeness that you have with another person. So a friendship could also be an intimate relationship. Certainly there are things that you look for in friendships, especially during this young adulthood period. So it talks about having an emotional connection, having common interests, having fun with another person. It may be that in your relationships there's one or more of these that's most important to you. But typically when people say, why do you have friendships, these are the things they're looking for. They're looking for support. They're looking for someone that they can enjoy being around and someone who has similar thoughts and interests as them. One thing I will say is that the more things you have in common with another person, the less likely it would be for you to have conflict with that person, which is great. But it's also not a bad idea to make sure that you surround yourself with some people who are a little bit different from you. If you only ever spend time around people who are like you, then you'll certainly miss out on a lot of perspectives that can really enrich your life. So when it talks about friendship quality here, 
the satisfaction that you derive from the friendship? Are you getting what you need out of the friendship? Are you enjoying this friendship? Um, it's very important for young adults to feel like they have someone to talk to. And if you feel like you don't have someone to talk to, you feel alone, like you don't have friendships and relationships, um, there's always counselors uh, or people who would be willing to, to talk with you. All right, so how do adult friendships develop? Well, this is a little bit different than the way that kids do friendships. Um, I have young kids, and whenever we go somewhere, um, we'll go to you know play somewhere at the park. My kids will meet kids they've never met before, and in a couple of minutes, it's like they're best friends, right? And that's kind of the way it is with kids. But with adults, it's a little bit different. Usually, it is a process of developing a friendship, and you start off with an acquaintanceship here. So likely, this is a person that you spend time around for another reason. Maybe this is someone you see at work someone who lives close to you, uh, someone who attends the same religious services or what have you. So someone you spend time around already, you get to know them a little bit. And then we have this gradual buildup where over time uh, we start to share more information with each other. Also, there's a mere exposure effect, the idea that the more time you spend around a person, the more you like them typically. Uh, so we have this gradual buildup until we reach a point where we would say, yes, we are friends. And then continuation, where we are maintaining that friendship. Perhaps you've had that experience where you have friends that you don't see very often or you don't have a chance to speak with very much, but yet you still feel close to them. Um, and then on the other hand, there may be some relationships where if you don't stay in touch, you don't see them frequently, you feel like you kind of lost that relationship. So... Whatever continuation looks like for that particular relationship, you maintain it. Now, of course, we would like to have lifelong friends, but we know that there are some friends that kind of come and go in our lives. Perhaps we are uh, moving to different places or we're in different stages of life when it comes to things like marriage, kids, etc. So sometimes there is a deterioration where you kind of gradually drift apart, kind of the opposite of the buildup that you had. And then eventually you would say, well, we're just not particularly close friends anymore. Maybe we keep in contact through social media or something like that, but uh, we wouldn't call ourselves friends anymore. Which is okay. We cycle through friendships throughout our lives. Now, we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about romantic relationships. And if I asked you to define love, there are probably many different potential answers to that question. Um, one thing, oftentimes when I ask students to define love, they say something like, I know I love the other person because I want what's good for them, even if it's not good for me. Maybe being willing to put someone else's needs before yours. One way to think about love is that it's like a triangle. So you see Sternberg's theory mentioned here. Um, Sternberg would suggest that there are three aspects of love. And so you can think of these as the different angles on a triangle. So we have passion, intimacy, and commitment. Now, one thing to note is that you may not have all of these. You may have relationships that only have one or two of these. Uh, or you may have various... Uh, amounts of these throughout different points in your relationship. More on that to come. But passion, just like it sounds, refers to a physical desire that you have for another person. Intimacy, as I said, is that psychological closeness. You depend on each other. You feel uh, like you need that person. And then commitment is an intention for the relationship to continue. So Commitment is really a way of thinking that then leads to certain behaviors. There are certain things you do when uh, you are committed that you wouldn't do if you weren't committed. So it says here that couples are happiest when they have similar types of love. So you can imagine that there could be a lot of conflict if, for example, one partner feels a high degree of passion and another partner does not, or if one partner has a high amount of commitment and the other partner does not. Um, you can certainly see that conflict could arise there. But as the relationship progresses, if it continues, if it lasts, there are some reliable trends. Um, typically what we see is that passion in particular decreases. So it talks here about the longer the relationship lasts, the lower the intimacy and passion. It doesn't necessarily have to be the case with intimacy. It doesn't necessarily have to decrease. Unfortunately, it sometimes does. Uh, passion, on the other hand, almost always decreases over time. Um, this is something that is kind of inevitable as you become 
comfortable with your partner, passion declines. But usually the longer lasting relationships are the ones where commitment is increasing. So as passion is going down, commitment is going up. And so we are shifting from this kind of romantic love to a more companionate love where we are best friends with each other. And the most successful long-term happy relationships are those that accept that change, that understand that passion is not the only thing or even the most important thing in a relationship. All right, but as I said, you definitely do not have to have all three components of love at one time. So infatuation is a type of love where passion is high, but intimacy and commitment are lower. This often happens in the beginning of a relationship. So in the beginning, we're usually not committed. And intimacy might be low because we just don't know the person that well. But passion is something that doesn't always take time. Sometimes passion develops very quickly, even if you don't know the person well. So with infatuation, we have high degrees of passion. Now, it might sound strange to talk about divorce rates here. If we don't have commitment, why are we getting married? But one thing that we see when it comes to individualistic cultures like ours is that couples are uh, likely to have low levels of commitment when they get married, which sounds very strange, but I think this plays into our divorce rates, which we're going to have a comprehensive conversation about coming up. So also, it talks here about choosing a partner that is similar to you. As I mentioned, if you have some things in common with your partner, this will decrease conflict. Um, certainly, there are some aspects of who you are that you feel like you don't have to have your partner reflect that same aspect. Uh, for example, my husband and I have very different hobbies, um, and that's, that's fine with me. Um, my husband enjoys duck hunting. I don't enjoy the thought of getting up early and being cold. You know, that's just not my thing. Um, but something that he enjoys doing, that's perfectly fine. However, there are some things that are important to you. And maybe it has to do with religious beliefs. And maybe it has to do with uh, whether or not you want to have children or how money should be handled. But whatever areas are most important to you uh, are the ones where you probably want your partner to view things in a similar way. And that might help your relationship to be a little bit more stable. Now, couples tend to be more similar to each other when they meet in examples here, school or religious settings. The idea is that the place where you meet someone might indicate that you have something in common with them. So if you were to meet your partner at school, then perhaps you're taking similar classes, you have similar interests, maybe you have similar career goals, uh, maybe you have similar socioeconomic status, all these things. And so perhaps that's why uh, the relationship is more successful. You have things in common. If you meet at a religious service, then likely you have similar views on a lot of things, not just religious belief, but religion often plays a role in our thoughts about family, our thoughts about sexuality, even our thoughts about politics. So I think that it is important for you to find partners that are similar to you in a lot of those areas that are most important to you. Now, as far as how we meet people, this is something that has changed over time. If you are blessed enough to still have your grandparents living, then I would encourage you to go talk to your grandparents or, or other older individuals you know and ask them what dating was like when they were younger and how did they meet their spouses. Uh, definitely has changed over time with the changes in our culture, but also with the changes in technology. So it talks about speed dating here. Uh, and this is something that I'm not even sure is available a whole lot in our area. Maybe I'm just, I've been out of the dating game for quite some time, have no idea. Um, but in larger cities, I would think speed dating would be more available for you. Uh, and then you have to think that when you are making decisions about whether or not you want to maintain contact with a person in a very short period of time, then probably physical attractiveness is the most um important thing for you or the thing that you're able to determine pretty quickly. It takes a lot longer than that to get to know a person, um, but you can tell whether or not you're physically attracted to them fairly quickly. But online dating is something that is much more common and not just online dating, but then also using technology to maintain long distance relationships. 
So if you ask older individuals, they will probably tell you that they met their partner um, because they grew up in the same town or they went to school together, they lived near each other. So it's not, um, not necessarily a long distance relationship, at least not as much in the past, but today you can have relationships with people around the world because of technology. So that's something new. Um, but then once again, physical attractiveness uh, definitely plays an important role, regardless of how you meet the other person. Um, on a survey, men are more likely to say that they're looking for physical attractiveness. But when we look at behaviors in who we choose and how we follow up on potential interactions, we don't see a lot of differences between men and women when it comes to physical attractiveness. In other words, men and women both look for physical attractiveness, but men are more likely to admit it on a survey. So what are we looking for? The slide here talks about what women want, but generally speaking, what do people want? Um, there are certain traits that everyone says they're looking for, looking for love, attraction, dependability, emotional stability, kindness, understanding. You may have some different things on your list. Uh, sometimes people talk about, I want a partner that is honest with me, trustworthy, that kind of thing. Um, but if we do see gender differences, we are more likely to see men saying that they want a partner who is physically attractive. Women are more likely to say they want a partner who's a good provider. Now, part of this could be that we are giving the answers that we think people are looking for, what they would expect, because this is kind of the stereotype of what men and women would look for. But there's also a theory, without going into any great detail, um, of evolutionary psychology or the idea that secretly, not really secretly, but more subconsciously, everything we're doing is about trying to make babies. It's just a theory here. But you can see how women, um, because they're only able to have a limited number of babies in their lifetime, would really want to focus on quality and looking for a partner that would stick around and help her limited number of children to thrive versus with men, because men are able to have more children throughout their lifespan, just biologically speaking, then they might look for more physically attractive partners. Um, and maybe this might mean men might be more likely to cheat, um, that kind of thing. Uh, it's just a theory um, that we've come up with to explain a few things that we see in relationships. Definitely not proven, but an interesting theory. All right, so if we're going to be talking about relationships, we need to touch on violence in relationships. This is a very important, very serious topic, um, one that people often don't talk about. And that's unfortunate. I think that we don't talk about it because we're not sure how to talk about it. And that's unfortunate because I think that when we don't talk about it, that makes it more likely to occur. Or people feel like what's happening to them is unique and different and therefore they feel like they're alone and don't have anywhere to turn. So it is important for us to discuss violence in relationships. So when it talks about an abusive relationship, a partner being violent or aggressive, Aggression essentially means you are intentionally harming another person, but that doesn't have to be physical aggression. So it talks down here about how this could be verbal aggression, physical aggression, uh, even severe physical aggression or killing someone. But there are other types of aggression. You have sexual aggression, you could have emotional aggression, um, verbal could include uh, manipulation and threatening, and there's a lot of different ways that a person can be aggressive. Now, the stereotype here is a husband or a male partner being aggressive towards a female partner. I think that that is likely the case in a lot of situations, but we have to remember that men can also be the victim of violence in relationships and are less likely to report it, probably because there's a stigma there about men uh, reporting that they have been abused. But when it talks here about a battered woman syndrome, this is the idea that a woman may feel trapped, may feel hopeless, helpless. This can definitely lead to psychological issues, depression in particular. Um, but if a woman is trapped in an abusive situation where she feels like perhaps um, she cannot leave without the person pursuing her, or if she feels like the person will um, try to harm other people that she cares about, then it is, there's the potential for a woman to go so far as to harm or even kill her abuser. Uh, I say all of that to say that it is very important for all individuals, and perhaps women in particular, to have access to uh, mental health services. 
um, to have someone to talk to when they are struggling through um, difficult situations like this. We try to understand why violence happens in relationships because as a human, whenever something bad happens, we automatically try to understand why it happened so we can try to fix it or try to prevent it in the future. Certainly we can't understand the cause of every individual case. Um, here are some things that have been supported by research. So some people are verbally abusive without being physically abusive, which does not necessarily mean then that this is less harmful. Certainly other types of abuse are, are very serious. Um, perhaps there's a personality issue here. The person uh, who is the abuser has this need to be in control or kind of this power trip that, that they're on. Um, but certainly marital problems. So if perhaps we could have some premarital counseling, if we could have some individual therapy, these kinds of issues could be addressed. Physical abuse, um, it talks about this happening uh, perhaps when the individual was abused as a child. We talked about the correlation between um, parents using physical punishment and then children growing up and then using that uh, style of interaction with their kids, but also potentially with uh, a spouse. So accepting violence as a means of control, kind of being taught that the individual with the power has the right to inflict physical pain on another person. So physically aggressive models. But then also, even if a person has not witnessed or been a victim of physical abuse, they could still become physically abusive. Uh, some individuals have this personality style. Um, we have personality disorders, things like antisocial personality, where you don't uh, really at all consider another person's perspective or how you're harming them. Um, but this can also be associated with substance abuse. And then talking about personality dis disorders, these are especially likely to be found in individuals who have a pattern of very severe physical abuse. Uh, as well as emotional issues here. So we might see someone who has a mood disorder, bipolar disorder in particular perhaps, uh, or other emotional issues, as well as low self-esteem, which once again can be correlated with mood disorders as well. So certainly an individual who has been uh, a victim of abuse would definitely, um, I would encourage that person to seek out individual therapy, but also someone who has been the abuser uh, might also benefit greatly from some type of individual therapy as well. All right, so for me, talking about romantic relationships, we need to talk about cohabitation. So we're talking here about couples who are living together but are not married. Now, this is something that has been on the rise in our culture, uh, and I think part of this is because the stigma against cohabitation has decreased a little bit. Um, but there are several reasons why couples might choose to cohabitate. One thing, it might just be that this seems like the best situation for both partners. If you're able to share your bills, you know, only pay one rent, that kind of thing. Uh, and sometimes we cohabitate with no long-term commitment. So this is the idea that right now we're going to live together because it works, but we're not talking about the future. We're not necessarily saying this is going to be a long-term situation. On the other hand, there might be some couples that we have the commitment, but we want to have a trial marriage, a trial run here. You might think of cohabitation as something where you have everything else going on except for the piece of paper. Uh, everything else is the same as if you were married. So perhaps you view this as we are committed, we just want to make sure that we can live together. And so you might consider this a trial marriage. But then finally, there may be some people that are committed but do not want to get married. And so cohabitation is a form of commitment for them without a legal marriage document. So it talks here about an example, maybe you might lose some kind of financial benefit or there's just something that um, would harm you in some way to get married or marriage is just not a possibility for you, but you're committed and so cohabitation might be an option in that situation. So we're talking about different types of couples here. The slides talk about gay and lesbian couples. So one thing that we see when we do research on relationships is that we often find similar results across different types of couples. And this is true for um, both homosexual and heterosexual couples. We find that they usually have very similar answers on surveys about what kinds of issues do they have, how happy are they. A lot of 
components of their relationships are very similar to each other. One thing that we do see, though, is that gay and lesbian couples are more likely to report that they have issues with their families, so perhaps having a decrease in support. Now, this may be something that's changing as well, but this is something that could be harmful to a relationship or to an individual, could definitely tear apart relationships with family members uh, if you felt like they were not being supportive of you and your relationship. Uh, it would definitely make a wide variety of relationship issues just a little bit harder. Um, when we're thinking about lacking in family support, we live in an individualistic culture anyway, where we are more likely to be separate from our families than people who live in a collectivist culture. So we may feel then like we are uh, out of touch with our families anyway. And so when we see couples here who are not having as much support from their families, and you can see how that could definitely contribute to relationship struggles or just personal hurt in general. All right, so let's talk about our activity, activity nine. First of all, I understand that this question may seem a little bit strange. Don't worry, I, this is never going to happen. I have no control over this and I'm sure this is never gonna happen. We're just hypothesizing this week. Activity nine, what do you think would happen if divorce was made illegal? Okay. We're about to talk about divorce and about the impacts of divorce. Um, how might this make relationships better? How would couples date differently, behave differently, if they knew that marriage was literally till death do us part? This could make relationships better, but it could also make relationships worse. So I'm going to ask you to think critically about how relationships would be different if divorce was illegal. But one thing I want to say here as you're considering this. Many of you will look at this question and say, that would be horrible. You'll shudder. And that's fine. If that's your reaction, as I said, it's not very likely this is going to happen. But some of you might look at this and say, huh, well, relationships might be a little bit better off if divorce was not an option. You don't need a lawyer or the law or a judge to tell you this. If, if there's something here that is attractive to you, you and your partner can make this decision amongst yourselves that, hey, for us in our unique situation, divorce is off the table, and that's just not something we're going to consider. If there is something about this that is attractive to you, if not, then that's perfectly fine as well. But I do look forward to reading these responses. I always get some really interesting comments on this one. So when we're talking about marriage here. One thing we're going to see is that there are some trends in marriages these days. The age at which couples marry has been rising, so people have been waiting longer and longer to get married. Your grandparents might have gotten married when they were teens. That's something that is less likely now, although one thing to note is that in the South, stereotypically people often get married younger here than they do in other locations. Um, but people are usually waiting longer. Perhaps this is because of college. More people are going to college and trying to get their career started before they get married. One thing that we see is that when, it talks about women, particularly being under the age of 20, women are almost always younger than a man when they get married. Um, what we see here is that women in particular who get married as teenagers are more likely to divorce. So three times more likely to divorce than women who marry in their 20s, six times more likely than women who marry in their 30s. Lots of potential thoughts here. And as someone who got married myself at a very young age, this does not have to always be the case. But you can see how there are a lot of stressors when you get married at a very young age. Financial stress, uh, where are we going to live, what are we going to do for careers, school stress, all those things then maybe make this more difficult to navigate. Also, the frontal lobe of your brain that controls a lot of aspects of your personality and thinking and decision making is not fully developed until you're 25. And so um, perhaps this can contribute to some decisions that maybe weren't the best at that age. So this is not the case for everyone, but certainly on average there is an increased risk for those marriages. So marriages are more likely to succeed when both partners are mature. One thing to note is that maturity and age don't always go together. There are certainly some very mature younger individuals and some older individuals that you wonder if they will ever grow up and maybe it seems like they never will. So this is not necessarily the same as age. However, um, we do see that 
people who get married younger tend to have a higher risk of divorce and maybe this is because they're not as mature. Also, as we've said, when you have things in common, especially those most important things to you, then that can decrease conflict. Uh, conflict just happens when you have some kind of disagreement, when your motives, opinions, beliefs, whatever, don't line up with that of another person. This is not necessarily a problem. Conflict happens all the time, and if we know how to navigate conflict, then it can actually be a good thing for relationships. Um, but unfortunately, we often don't have conflict resolution skills. Uh, also, we tend to be happier in marriages and more successful when each partner contributes equitably. In other words, if you feel like your relationship is fair, this does not necessarily mean that you're making the same amount of money or that you're doing exactly the same amount of chores. You want to feel like the effort that you are putting in and the rewards you are getting are roughly equivalent to the effort that your partner's putting in and the rewards that your partner's getting. And so you and your partner have to negotiate exactly what that looks like. If one partner is working full time and the other partner is home taking care of kids, then it can be a little bit hard to figure out who had a harder day, who's working harder. Definitely uh, depends on how many kids are at home and their age and how well they sleep. And some kids are just harder to take care of than others. But make sure that you feel like your relationship is equitable. Uh, obviously, honesty is very important. Commitment, and I said that commitment levels tend to be lower in our culture, so that could be one reason why our divorce rate is so high, uh, but definitely important. All right, so do married couples stay happy? Really loaded question here. When you know the divorce rate is so high, you know that they do not always stay happy, and even some couples that stay married are not happy. Here's a few things to think about. Typically, satisfaction is highest in the beginning. When you look at married couples, the day they get married is usually the height of their happiness, which is kind of sad. Um, they do tend to have kind of a drop-off in satisfaction. Having said that, though, when you compare married couples with couples that are divorced or with individuals that are widowed, uh, married couples are typically higher in life satisfaction. So you may have a little bit of a drop off here, but you'll still on average be happier than other types of individuals. One thing to note is that having kids can cause a decrease in happiness in your marriage. And you can see why this might be. It's not just the fact that you're tired and there's this extra responsibility, but also you have less time uh, alone as a couple. And so you may see that when kids move out, if you have managed to maintain the intimacy that you have with your partner, then the satisfaction can go back up again. Um, not always the case, but can go back up again. Obviously, couples are going to be more happy um, when the dependence is equal, when you feel like you both need each other uh, in a roughly equal amount. Um, it's talking here about stress. Certainly, we are a stressed out culture. Uh, stress is not just about what's going on in your life right now. It's a combination of a stressor and your stress response. It's the way you respond to the stress. And there's a theory that it's not about what happens to you, but it's about do you have the resources to handle what's happening to you and what kinds of thoughts are you having about the situation that really determine how stressed out you get. Two people can go through the same stressful situation and have very different responses because of their resources or because of their attitude about the situation. So... Certainly we could all, or most of us, myself included, um, could use some tips on handling stress. But you can see that in a marriage, this is especially important not to take out your stress on your partner, which might be tempting because your partner is available and maybe you feel like I can't take it out on my boss or my parents or whoever else and you feel like you can take it out on your partner. Certainly your marriage may feel very vulnerable, um, but finding a way to handle that stress that spills over into your personal life is very important. And this is a good time for you guys to learn self-care, to learn how to eat and sleep and relax and find somebody to talk to. Really good time to do that. All right. Now, the early years of marriage. A lot of research on marriage focuses on risk factors for divorce so that we can then try to identify which couples are at risk and get them into treatment and try to save some of these marriages. So it is helpful if couples 
discuss financial matters, discuss expectations, figure out how to handle conflict. All of these things could be accomplished through premarital counseling if it's done the right way. I would encourage you to consider premarital counseling, multiple sessions, not just the one that a religious leader might require to marry you, but multiple sessions, having these conversations. Uh, if we know what kinds of things couples fight about later, if we can at least have a plan in the beginning for those, then that can be really great. Uh, disillusionment refers to having unrealistic expectations. We think that the life is supposed to be like the notebook. And social media and movies um, really don't help with this. We have very unrealistic views of marriage. And then ambivalence, um, this is a term people often misunderstand. Ambivalence does not mean I don't care. Ambivalence is like feeling torn. So, for example, if we're talking about ambivalence in a marriage, you might say, well, I can see the good things about being married, but I can also see the good things about being single. Well, that's ambivalence. You're saying, I'm torn because I like this, but I could also like this too. Um, this is something that's definitely associated with dissatisfaction. So finding ways to resolve that ambivalence, very important. Uh, also, having a plan for how to maintain your marriage while having children, uh, if you plan to have children. One thing that you'll see is that rearing children, on average, can result in less satisfaction, especially when the kids are younger and very dependent on their parents. But one thing to note is that satisfaction goes down both for couples who have kids as well as couples who don't have kids. And so um, probably just the stress of life and um, that decline in passion that I talked about can lead to a decrease in satisfaction in any type of relationship. All right, so what do we need to do to try to keep our marriages happy? Well, one thing to think about is that many of us don't have a lot of good role models. I mean, with a 50% divorce rate uh, or even a little bit higher divorce rate, we don't necessarily have a lot of very happy couples that we can look at and say, give us wisdom, give us advice about how to maintain our happiness. On average, couples that are happy tend to be forgiving, understandable, flexible, adaptive, interested in each other. So basically exactly what you would expect. Uh, looking for couples that care about each other, pour into each other, keep the romance alive, so trying to maintain that passion whenever possible. Um, expressing love, one thing that we see is that um, within that first year or two, the, um, the affection that couples show for each other tends to decline, so things like um, calling each other sweet names or holding hands and that kind of thing tends to decline. And so that's something that you have control over. You can directly choose to engage in those behaviors that continue to express love. Uh, confide in each other as opposed to confiding in other people. So making sure that you are uh, sharing things with your partner. Um, communicating constructively and positively. There's a lot to be said about communication, but making sure that you are specific in what you're trying to communicate brief. Um, giving the other person a chance to paraphrase, so kind of saying back what they're hearing in their own words to show that they are listening, but then also to give you a chance to correct them if they misunderstood you. Uh, certainly a lot of things we can learn about communication. Also, couples that share the same religious beliefs. Now, you can see that if you share the same religious beliefs, then you're probably on the same page with a lot of issues, and so this can reduce conflict. But this seems to be especially true in lower socioeconomic status groups, so in individuals who are uh, closer to that poverty level. And perhaps that is because uh, religious beliefs might provide uh, a way for them to handle the stress that can often come with living in poverty. So that can be really helpful. All right. Uh, different ways that families can look. We think about a nuclear family in our culture. Primarily, we're thinking about parents and children. Um, and this is a very individualistic way of doing things, living kind of as a family unit with just parents and kids. However, in uh, more collectivist cultures, they're more likely to live together or very close to their parents, grandparents, other relatives, aunts, uncles, cousins. 
uh, talks in particular about this being common among Latino families, but uh, usually with minority families in general, there's stronger relationship bonds, uh, which can lead to a lot of uh, positive outcomes. So I think that this is something that we could learn from in our culture about making sure that we're maintaining high quality relationships. And this wouldn't necessarily even have to be with a biological family, but if you have friends, um, people that are close to you, having uh, someone to turn to, talk to, social support is very important. So it talks here, this is really a collectivist way of thinking, this familial view here that the family's well-being is more important than any one particular person. Certainly we want to care about the outcomes of all individuals, um, but this is the idea of trying to be selfless in the way that we interact with each other. And this could potentially be why we see uh, much lower divorce rates in collectivist cultures. That and the fact that collectivist cultures tend to have more stigma against divorce, perhaps. Uh, so lots of potential reasons there. All right, deciding whether or not to have children. We actually talked about this a little bit in the very beginning of the class when we were talking about prenatal development. I asked you guys to think about um, how many kids you might want to have or what kinds of things go into that decision. About 50% of pregnancies are unplanned in our culture. And so you can see how that could then lead to uh, a lot of different things. Uh, some pregnancies might be unplanned, but uh, we feel like we have the resources and we're excited for that. And then sometimes people might feel very overwhelmed when they see a positive pregnancy test. Uh, one reason why people might feel overwhelmed is that it certainly is expensive to have a child, uh, depending on your situation. If you're thinking about things like prenatal care, um, the cost of having a baby, like the hospital costs. But beyond that, there's certainly a lot of other costs as well. If you have kids now, or if you have kids in the future, I don't encourage you to Google. I have these numbers here, I'm sorry. Hopefully you'll forget them. Um, as far as how much it costs to have kids, um, I one time tried to calculate how much money my husband and I had spent on diapers, and that was just super depressing. Um, and now we've got another one in diapers right now. So. Um, certainly it is very expensive to have kids. Uh, we do see that couples who do not have kids tend to have a little bit higher standard of living because they're not paying for diapers um, and perhaps greater marital satisfaction. So we did say there tends to be a decline um, while the kids are young and then that kind of rebounds later when the kids get older. So that could be one thing, but your satisfaction does tend to drop off at least somewhat even if you don't have kids. But one thing is that having kids used to be viewed as a rite of passage, um, something that's really important for becoming an adult. Uh, but I think that the attitudes about this have changed somewhat. All right. So one thing that we see is that couples are having fewer children and waiting longer to have them. Um, and part of this might be because we have access to birth control or to uh, education. Um, Part of this might be because we are waiting longer to get married or because couples are wanting to be set financially um, before they do get married. There is a balancing act here. If you have kids later in life, then you might be a little bit more mature, maybe a little bit more psychologically stable, financially stable. But then also as you get older, having kids that does increase the risk of genetic disorders. We're talking about older, like 35 plus. Um, does increase the risk of genetic disorders as well as just being tired and older when you have kids. Uh, on the other hand, if you have kids younger, uh, you might feel very stressed out, but then perhaps um, you're still young enough to be able to cope well with the sleepless nights. So there's, there's a balancing act here. Uh, one thing to note is that women are working outside of the home more now. Um, and so this can lead to women feeling like they have to do both. They, sociology refers to this as a second shift, the idea that women often work all day and then come home and still put more into household tasks and child rearing tasks than husbands do. Although um, we do see an increase today in uh, the, especially spending time with their kids, um, especially in older fathers. So we are seeing some improvement here, but moms are still more likely to be doing the majority of childcare and household tasks as well. 
All right, what about other types of families? So it talks here about step families, foster families, adoptive families, lots of different reasons why couples might choose to adopt. It could be because um, they're not able to have biological children. They don't want to have biological children. It talks about same-sex couples here. Um, the idea is that a third of couples in North America are having these uh, kind of non-traditional families that could be adoptive, foster, or step. Uh, with a 50% divorce rate, certainly we're seeing an increase in step families as well. Um, we do tend to see that step families can struggle a little bit, uh, especially if the divorce happened during adolescence. That's a difficult time. Uh, for kids to go through that situation of having their parents divorce and remarry. But what we see is that foster parents typically report having the most difficulty developing and maintaining bonds compared with uh, step parents or adoptive parents. And you can see why this might be if you're not sure how long the child will be in your care, if you might have to give the child back to um, biological family or to another foster family, then certainly that would be really difficult. Having said that though, there's so much good that can be done here, uh, so much love that can be shown to kids who desperately need it, um, that certainly this is a beautiful and, and wonderful thing. Alright, so we've been hinting at these statistics for this entire lecture. 50% um, divorce rate is kind of a rule of thumb that we typically use. Some of the latest research says that these numbers are even higher, maybe 54 plus percent of, of marriages end in divorce. Uh, and of course you have a higher risk if you get married at an earlier age. So why is it that we have such a high divorce rate? Well, individualistic culture, where we tend to look out more for ourselves than other people. Um, Women working outside of the home has often been cited as a potential cause for divorce because there's conflict over gender roles, who's going to take care of the kids, who's going to do the housework, but then also women have access to financial provision themselves and so maybe they feel like they can get divorced because they can provide for themselves and, and for kids. Um, maybe we don't have good social support, maybe we have unrealistic expectations, the list could go on and on and on. One thing that we see is a difference in ethnicity, and I think that a lot of this goes back to that individualistic versus collectivist way of thinking. Uh, so it talks about African and Asian American couples typically stay together longer before divorcing. So if they're going to get divorced, they typically try harder and longer. Uh, so then uh, Caucasian couples often divorce a little bit earlier. Um, what we see is that divorce rates are higher in individualistic cultures and, and lower in collectivist cultures. And we see that minority groups often report a more collectivist viewpoint, um, maybe because they have more relationships with family members close by. And so that can be uh, supportive of marriages there. It talks about ethnically mixed marriages are at risk. This could be because of um, stigma in our culture. This could be because of a different upbringing, different experiences, causing conflict, that kind of thing. Uh, it could be because of family issues, etc. But uh, certainly that doesn't mean that they can't be successful, but there is an increased risk there. As far as why couples get divorced, uh, infidelity is, um, on a lot of surveys, a lot of research says infidelity is the most common reason that women report for divorce. Uh, and maybe that's because men cheat more than women do. Um, one third of husbands cheat and one fifth of wives uh, on a survey. And you have to think people probably aren't telling the truth. Those true numbers might be a little bit higher, uh, which is a little scary. Other things people often say, incompatibility, drug or alcohol abuse, uh, growing apart. People often talk about uh, financial issues or in-law issues, family issues there. You'll see a list here of some different reasons that men and women cite. I think it's important to note that a lot of these overlap. So men and women are agreeing about a lot of these reasons. And I think it's important to understand why people are saying that they're getting divorced because then we can identify what areas we need to have um, specifically taken care of in premarital counseling, having plans for these, having support for these. One thing I will say is that we're asking people why they think they got divorced. And people are not always self-aware, don't always know exactly why the divorce happened. 
So certainly um, there are things like, for example, the age at which you got married is not on this list. Um, socioeconomic status is not directly listed. I mean, financial problems, perhaps. Um, we see people who are educated tend to be less likely to get divorced. So there are a lot of things that are not on this list. We're just asking people why they think they got divorced. But it is interesting to look over this list. A lot of them are very similar to each other. Uh, one thing you'll note is that you see physical abuse as the reason that women listed, not a reason that men listed. Although certainly that doesn't mean that men are not being physically abused, but maybe they're just not reporting it. All right, so I said that if you are opposed to the idea of divorce, if you have a more permanent view of marriage that till death do us part is literally what you mean, then you might pursue a covenant marriage. Now, this is a legal term, and I haven't done my research on this. I don't think this is available in Mississippi. It might be. I'm not sure. But in some states, they have covenant marriage where you are not forbidden to get divorced, but that there are a lot of um, barriers to divorce that are built in. This is just something extra that you do when you get married, essentially saying that if we start having problems, we cannot get divorced until we've gone to counseling, until we've tried this or that, or until we've had this waiting period here. So it makes it harder to get a divorce, trying to maintain that marriage. So if divorce does happen, there are different ways for this to go. Sometimes it is a very nasty, drawn-out process. We're trying to figure out custody, and we're talking about dividing up assets. But also, you can have a collaborative divorce where a couple decides that they're going to negotiate their divorce, and it doesn't have to be something that involves a lot of lawyers and a lot of drama. It's just going to be very straightforward. Uh, and certainly I can see the benefit in taking care of this amongst yourselves. Um, there are a lot of different thoughts on how to try to prevent divorce. So it talks here about trying to stress the positive aspects of marriage, um, educate people both before marriage and after, uh, to try to help them have realistic expectations, how to communicate, how to resolve conflict. One thought that I have is uh, that perhaps we do need to make marriage a little bit harder to enter into. Maybe we need to have couples required to do premarital counseling or to have some kind of waiting period before they get married um, to try to help people realize the uh, significance of marriage, perhaps. But just a thought. What does divorce do uh, to the couple? Well, one thing that we see is that women often receive custody of any children that are there. Uh, which then can cause financial issues for women. Not necessarily that that's a bad thing that women get custody, but that then a woman might be uh, out of the work field or perhaps she was working part-time. Or even if a woman is working full-time, um, women are not likely to be paid as much as men. So this can definitely cause financial issues. However, some women say that divorce went really well for them, especially if they were the one that initiated the divorce. Maybe they felt like they were in a bad situation, and then afterwards they felt like they were much better off. So certainly there are some things that are correlated with better adjustment. One of the best things that you can do after any kind of breakup, but especially with a marriage, is to try to move forward without hostility towards your partner. And that's difficult sometimes, but working with a counselor, um, trying to find peace and uh, feel like you're moving forward in a positive direction instead of kind of clinging to that grief. There certainly should be a grieving period, but then after that, feeling like you can move forward. Then the question is, um, are we going to get remarried? Are we going to seek out other marriages? Well, men are more likely to remarry than women, and younger women are more likely to remarry than older women. So that's one thing that we see on average on the research. Now, how does divorce impact children? Well, we're talking about divorce and young adult. We're talking about social development and young adulthood. So perhaps you are the one going through the divorce, but perhaps your parents are getting divorced and you're a young adult going through that. So we do see that there are especially um, problems when parents get divorced when their children are going through adolescence. Uh, but it can also be hard when you're a young adult and your parents get divorced. This can definitely change the way you view your own marriage. Um, perhaps this changes whether or not you want to pursue marriage in the future. Some people will say that watching their parents go through divorce made them more committed to their relationships because they didn't want to go through that themselves. But then on average, we do see an increased risk for divorce in kids if the parents divorce. 
One thing that's interesting is that we see that if your parents get divorced while you're a young adult, we see that the young adult tends to feel closer to their mother, but they feel farther away from their father. And maybe that's because we often blame uh, the husband for a divorce. Maybe if he's the one that initiated it or if there was some kind of infidelity, it's a little more likely that uh, a father would cheat, a man would cheat than a woman. So this can definitely impact relationships with both parents. So what about remarriage? Well, as I said, women are less likely to remarry, but if they do remarry, men and women usually wait about the same amount of time, on average about three and a half years. So hopefully that's enough time to process what you've been through, maybe seek out some counseling, some support, take some time. Uh, there are a few groups that are more likely to remarry, so it talks about European Americans, so Caucasian individuals here. Uh, military veterans, those with less education, just a few groups on average that remarry more. We do see that second and subsequent marriages are more likely to end in divorce than original marriages. This could be because whatever the problem was in your first marriage you brought with you. This could be because uh, an individual has a certain personality style or attachment style that then causes relationship problems or it could be that since you already have been divorced you're obviously not super opposed to divorce and so you view that as a, a viable option in the future but it might also be that if you remarry and there are stepchildren involved that can cause a lot of chaos among families and can cause um, relationships to end so um, women might be less likely to remarry, as I said, unless they are poor. And we see women might feel like they have to remarry if this is an option for them to provide for themselves and for their children. So that sounds really unfortunate. We wouldn't want anyone to get married if they didn't want to, um, but women might view this as a financial necessity. All right, so that is the end of this particular lecture. Remember that you do have an activity that's going to ask your thoughts about what would happen if divorce was not an option, so I look forward to reading that. Let me know if you have any questions or concerns, and I will talk to you guys during our next lecture video. Y'all have a great day.